All right, kiddos, welcome back. We just finished talking about the Bohr model of the atom. And almost as soon as we were finished talking about it, we said, well, the Bohr model is not as accurate or as nice as we would like it to be. Remember, the Bohr model had this nucleus in the center of the atom, which most of the mass of the atom is contained, and these electrons buzzing around the nucleus in these nice, pretty circular orbits. There can be the orbit closest to the nucleus, which is the ground state, and then there's another orb orbit farther away. We'll call it the second energy level, or second orbit, and one farther away, and so on, and so on, and so on, that electrons can move from one orbit or energy level to another when energy is added, and when they fall back down, energy is released. Okay, Bohr treated the electron like a particle. Now, the frequencies predicted by Bohr for the hydrogen spectrum are essentially correct, but not exactly. Improved instrumentation has shown that the hydrogen spectral lines predicted by Bohr are not single lines. Remember the hydrogen spectrum, kiddos? Let's take a look at it again. So these lines that we see on the hydrogen spectrum, this red one here, uh, these blue and purple ones over here, they're not actually single lines. Um, Instead, they are several lines closely spaced together, and there needed to be an accounting for this, and so the atomic theory was then again refined. De Broglie used Planck's ideas concerning radiation and the idea of discrete amounts of energy called quanta. This theory seemed to give waves the properties of particles. De Broglie thought if Planck were correct, then it might be possible for particles to have the properties of waves. And that's very, very profound, that particles can have wave properties to them. So if we treat an electron like a wave instead of like a particle, we can better understand how the electron spends its time around the nucleus of an atom. If you think about it, an electron is really, really tiny and moving around at a pretty doggone fast speed. If we compare that to maybe a photon of light or electromagnetic radiation, which is really, really tiny and moving around at a very, very fast speed, they both can have properties of waves. Scientists found by experiment that in some ways an electron acted in the same way as a stream of light. Furthermore, the wavelength of electrons turned out to be exactly what de Broglie had predicted. So we have this important question that we're going to try to answer now. In fact, you might not like my answer, but we're going to answer it anyway. Is Bohr correct in the fact that an electron is acting like a particle, or is de Broglie correct saying that an electron behaves like a wave? And it turns out that the answer is quite simply yes. Yeah, I told you you wouldn't like it. What do you think that means? Yeah, it means that the electron has wave properties to it, and it has particle properties to it. There is a wave-particle duality nature to an electron, and that's what de Broglie tried to help us understand. So the de Broglie equation, which you're going to see right here, lambda, the wavelength, is equal to Planck's constant divided by the product of the mass of the particle and its velocity. This equation predicts that all moving particles uh, that could be a baseball, uh, that could be a car, that could be anything that's moving, an electron. All moving particles have wave characteristics to them. It also explains why it's impossible to notice the wavelength of a fast-moving car. Think about this. An automobile moving at 25 meters per second, having a mass of 900 kilograms, almost a thousand kilograms, has a wavelength according to the de Broglie equation, of 2.9 times 10 to the negative 38th meters. A wavelength far too small to be seen or even detected. Now by comparison, what if we have a really, really tiny object, like an electron, moving at the same speed? It has an easily measured wavelength of 2.9 times 10 to the negative 5th meters, because its size is so small. Subsequent experiments have proven that electrons and other moving particles do indeed have wave characteristics. De Broglie knew that if an electron has wave-like motion and is restricted to circular orbits of fixed radius, 
Only certain wavelengths, frequencies, and energies are possible. Developing his idea, de Broglie derived the following equation, which we just went over a few moments ago. Now, fortunately for us, we're not going to worry about applying this and using it in our class. I'm just pointing it out to you and helping us hopefully understand that electrons can have particle, a particle nature to them and also a wave nature to them. Along with de Broglie, Werner, he Werner Heisenberg was on the scene. He pointed out that in order to find the exact position of an electron, we must be able to look at it. That makes sense. However, when we look at an object large enough to see with our eyes, we're actually seeing the light waves that the object has reflected. A similar thing happens when a radar sees an airplane. Those electromagnetic radiations are bouncing off the airplane and coming back towards us, and we can see it. In other words, for us to see an object, it must be hit by a photon of radiant energy. This has a negligible effect on an airplane or any other object that we can actually see because those objects are so massive and the photons are so tiny they have minimal kinetic energy. However, the collision between a photon and an electron results in a large change in energy for the electron. So when a photon of light hits an electron, boom, that actually changes its position. So if we can see an electron with some sort of radiant energy, we would not know its velocity because the collision between it and the photons has changed its velocity. Thus, we might know the position, but not the velocity of an electron. So we can't predict where it will be later. On the other hand, if we could measure its velocity, the electron's position is now changing. Heisenberg stated that there is always some uncertainty about the position and the momentum of an electron. This is known as the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Perhaps you've heard of it before. The Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Along with Heisenberg was Erwin Schrödinger. Scientists now found themselves unable to describe the exact structure of an atom. Heisenberg had stated that the exact motion of an electron was unknown. Remember, Bohr's model predicted it could be known. Notice that Heisenberg treated the electron as a particle. What if it were treated as a wave? Schrodinger treated the electron as a wave and developed a mathematical equation to describe its wave-like behavior. With this equation, he was able to find an area of high probability where an electron could be found. Not exactly where it could be found, but what we call an area of high probability. The electron moves around the nucleus, passing through these points of high probability more often than through other points. The electron is traveling at a high speed. If the electron were visible to the eye, it would appear to look like a cloud. So think of what a fan blade looks like when it's turned on. It's a blur. So as the electron moves around in these three-dimensional spaces, it would appear to be a cloud. Thus, the orbital of an electron is often referred to as an electron cloud. Schrodinger's equation has helped us devise a set of quantum numbers to describe the position of, electron, of an electron orbiting around the nucleus. So the set of quantum numbers we are going to view as like an address for the electron. There are a set of four numbers that we are going to become familiar with. So here we go. This takes us into a field called quantum mechanics. In order to locate an electron in an atom, there are four numbers that give us an idea of where the electron is. For each quantum number, there's a physical representation and mathematical values that a particular number can have. So I'm going to talk about those four quantum numbers now and hopefully help you understand how they can help describe where an electron is as it's buzzing around the nucleus of an atom. The first quantum number is actually very, very easy to understand. It's called the n quantum number. This simply represents the energy level that the electron is in. Mathematically, the n quantum number is an integer. That means it's a whole number, folks, that has to be greater than or equal to 1. So n could equal 1, 
it could equal 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. It must be integers, and that simply represents the energy level that the electron is in. So if I were describing an electron in the first energy level, its end quantum number would obviously be 1. You guessed it. Well, what if it were in the fourth energy level? Well, then the end quantum number would be 4. Yes. Isn't the end quantum number easy to understand? Once again, these must be integers because we don't have an electron buzzing around the nucleus between energy levels in a stable orbital. It has to be on a whole number or integer number uh, energy level. All right. Now the L quantum number. So the font I'm using didn't do a good job with my L, so I'm going to make a cursive little L there. This number represents the sublevel the electron is in. Mathematically, L is an integer again. Its values range from 0 all the way up to n, the energy level, minus 1. For example, if I had an electron in the fourth energy level, L can have four values. L can be 0, right, because it always starts with 0, 1, 2, or 3. That takes me to n minus 1. 4 minus 1 is 3. So these are the possible L values that exist in the third energy level. 0, 1, 2, or 3. Let's say n equals 3. What do you think the possible L values were? What are the possible sublevels when L is equal to 3? If you said 0, nice start. 1 and 2, because n minus 1 is 2. What if I am on the second energy level? What values can L have? Good, you're starting with 0, and then you said 1, because n minus 1, 2 minus 1 is 1. Notice that the number of sublevels, in this case, when, when I have three sublevels, it's equal to the energy level number. When I was on the second energy level, weren't there two possible sublevels? And when I was on the fourth energy level, weren't there four possible sublevels? How many sublevels do you think are po possible on the seventh energy level? If you said seven, very good. They would be zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six. All right, let's move on. These first four values of L have special names that will have to be learned. Now, we actually don't have to learn their names. We just need to know the first letter that the name starts with. So when L is equal to 0, we call that the S sublevel. It used to be called the sharp sublevel. But we just call it the S sublevel now. When L is equal to 1, we call that the P sublevel. It used to be called the principal sublevel. When L is equal to 2, we call that the D sublevel, and that used to be known as the diffuse sublevel. And then finally, when L is equal to 3, it became known as the F sublevel, and F stood for the fundamental sublevel. As L gets bigger, we just go alphabetically. So if L got to 4, we would call that the G sublevel. If L got to 5, we'd call it the H sublevel, etc. Okay? All right, we're going to stop here on this video, let you digest that a little bit, maybe watch it again if you need to, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about these sublevels and what they look like or what they're. Uh, when the electron is behaving like a wave, what that wave pattern would look like. So we'll talk about that next. Thanks. Bye-bye.